Welcome back everyone. This is the last in the series of looking at the Arduino code for the Monoboard project. And today we're going to look at the actual speed controller. So this is a particularly important module in that it controls the actual commutation sequence to the brushless DC motor. Now I I'm still in the process of actually testing this interface, so this is not complete. I haven't implemented regenerative braking yet, and there may well be some changes. So, look, I just wanted to give you an update of where I'm at. I've also published the code to GitHub, and there'll be a link below for that. So feel free to grab it, have a look at it. I would welcome comments as usual. Anyway, let's have a look at it now. Okay, so let's grab the library from GitHub. So we'll just open a new window, uh, paste in the GitHub URL. I'll put this in the description down below as per normal. So this is the actual, a uh, little bit of information about the speed controller library. Now, this is really important. It's only designed to work with the STM32. It's using PWM outputs for all of the motor drive signals and you know that will work on some of the larger Adreno boards but I really just focus this on the STM32 because of the additional speed that's available from the processor and everything. So anyway, just a word of warning there and there's a little bit more information here as well. So what we want to do is uh, download the zip file and when that's finished downloading, I might just put that there so we can find it later. That's all we need that for. Okay, so now we just start up the Adreno application. Now I don't know if this is a slow on everyone else's PC or Mac, but on this Mac, this thing is so slow to load, it's glacial. It is such a pain in the butt. I've got no idea what the hell it's doing when it's starting up to take so long, but it is painful. Xcode opens faster than this thing. Okay, so it's up and going. Right, what we want to do is go into sketch in the menu, uh, include library, and we want to add a zip library. Uh, just navigate to the desktop and there's our speed controller master zip file that we downloaded. We just choose that and that should now be installed. If we go and have a look at file examples and, and navigate down to the bottom here, we've now got the speed controller and there should be an example file there. So let's get rid of that other rubbish one. Now, this is still in development at this point in time, so it's not complete, but feel free to have a look at it and see what I'm doing. Anyway, as far as using the actual library, first of all, we need to include the actual library for use. And then what we need to do is define where our inputs and outputs are. So just defining the pins for the hall sensors and also the PWM outputs for the phase top and phase bottom drivers. So here, just creating an instance of the speed controller and just creating a variable here that we're just going to use for doing the testing. Next thing, going into the setup, uh, starting the serial port just for this test purpose, and then actually setting the sensor pins on the speed controller, uh, setting the output pins on the speed controller, calling setup just to initialize the speed controller, and then just setting the speed to zero so that when we get into the loop and actually starts processing, it doesn't sort of take off. Setting the speed value or that test value to zero, and then we move into the loop. So in the loop, 
this block of code here is really all just about doing this test. So all I'm doing is monitoring the serial port. If I see a Q character, then increasing that speed value by 100. And if I see an A value, then decreasing the value by 100. And then constraining it. The speed controller is set up to operate at around 30 kilohertz frequency for the PWM. And what we found is to get that value, we need to keep the drive limits to 2000. So minus 2000 to positive 2000. So just calling constraint here to make sure that value stays within minus 2000 and plus 2000. And then echoing it back out on the serial port and then calling the controller execute function. And that's all that's really required. There is an emergency stop function as well that you can call that will stop the motor as quick as it possibly can. And that's pretty much it as far as the motor control goes. There may be a few things that get added along the way as the testing progresses with this, but I just wanted to get this out there. I guess what we should do now is take a look at how it actually operates. Okay, so when we're looking at how this works, I guess we should go back to the start and just briefly talk about the commutation sequence of the brushless DC motor. Look, there's plenty of YouTube videos on this. I would recommend that you just do a search and take a look at them. Um, this sort of covers off on basically sort of what happens in the motor. We've got a series of poles and a rotor with magnets on it. And all that's happening is we are varying the current through the different sets of coils to attract the magnet on the rotor towards that pole piece. And that's done in a continuous manner such that it causes the rotor to rotate. What I've got here is a little video that just details the different coils that are in play for each particular position. Now the position of the rotor is measured by three Hall effect sensors, one, two and three. From those Hall sensors we can determine which coils we need to turn on. I can just drag this through different positions and we can see how it actually works. So we've got the Hall sensors up the top here and we've got the H bridge outputs down here. So winding A, whether it's the high side is turned on or whether the low side's turned on, winding B and winding C. So at the moment at zero degrees, we've got hall sensor one and hall sensor three on, and that translates through to having the high side of phase B turned on and the low side of phase C. And if we just drag this through, you'll see we've gone to the next state now where we've got only hall sensor one on. And in that case, phase B is high and phase A is low. Uh, we've got to the next stage where hall sensor one is off, hall sensor two is on, and that translates to phase C high side and phase B low side. And that just works in that manner as it rotates. So if I just play this, you'll get a bit of a feel for how it actually moves through. That's pretty much it in a nutshell. But as I say, please do some more research. There is quite a lot out and about on YouTube and most of it is very, very good. Now, if I just minimize this for the minute, and move that down here, we can see how that translates through to this truth table that I've built. I've just got the sensors here, one, two, and three, just calculating what I call a commutation position here. That's just converting uh, sensor one, two, and three to the binary value with uh, one being the least significant bit and three being the most significant, so nice and simple. And then I've got the uh, A top and B bottom. So these are the outputs that will be actually switching the transistors in the H bridge. And same for B top, B bottom, C top, C bottom. So what I'm doing here is for each commutation position, I've determined which outputs should be on to go forwards uh, to go reverse. I've started looking at regenerative braking. I haven't actually implemented that in this code yet, 
because there are two different levels of regenerative braking, one where we just switch one output and a second type where we actually switch both outputs. So I'm just still researching that at this point in time. So there'll be more to come on that front. So for the testing at the moment, I've only implemented the forward and reverse and the emergency stop. Okay, so let's just take a look at this particular state here, which is actually the first one in this sequence where hall sensor one was on and hall sensor three was on. That effectively calculates through to a commutation position of five. And in that position, we want the B top to be on and the pulse width modulated signal to be applied to the C bottom. And you'll see the states of the sensors that I've set up are in the order of rotation. So you'll see there's quite a pattern with the Hall effect sensors and you'll see the pattern with the switching signals to the transistors as well. So this is what we want to implement in code. So let me just close that for the minute. Minimize that a little bit. Okay, so let's just bring up the header file for the library. Okay, so first of all, the license blurb like normal. We've got a couple of defines here. The first one, PWM max. I'll talk about this a little bit later. It's to do with setting up the maximum PWM signal that's going to be required. And the next one, sensor per rev. It's used in the calculation for speed, just as it's mentioned there. This will need to be changed depending upon your particular motor. Next, we've got some defines for the actual drive modes. Then we've got the methods for setting up the sensor pins and the output pins. A setup method to call just to initialize everything. The execute method that actually sets all the outputs. A speed adjust method to set the speed request and an emergency stop. And there's one property on this class, the motor speed, so you can read the actual speed of the motor. And then there's a number of private methods that we'll talk about as we go through the code file. And there's a number of internal variables as well. So now let's have a look at the actual code file. Normal license blurb. Okay, so one thing I must mention about this particular library, I've only designed it to work with the STM32. And as such, this include here is an include only for the STM32. It's not required for the Arduino and it will actually cause an error on compilation. And I don't think that's such a bad idea. So if you do try and compile it against a Atmega chip, that will error and it just stops any unforeseen things happening. Okay, here's the constructor for the actual class. And all we're doing there is creating the hardware timers. Now these two hardware timers relate to the PWM outputs we'll be using later on. And we need to do this because we're going to manipulate how they work. Okay, the next thing we're just setting the speed reference internal variable to zero and setting the operating mode to no drive. Okay, the next thing we've got here is set the sensor pins. So we're just passing in the pins that we're going to use and just storing them locally. Same with the output pins, just passing them in, saving them locally. In the setup method, we set the input and the PWM outputs up. And the next thing we do is adjust the timer operation for timer two and timer three. As I mentioned, those two timers are used for the PWM outputs. And what we need to do is change the frequency of the PWM signals because the standard frequency is just not high enough. I've done a separate video on this. I'll link it in below. But anyway, what we're doing is adjusting the frequency such that it's up around 30 kilohertz. And we do that by changing the prescale factor on the timer and setting the overflow to a different value. And as I mentioned above that defined PWM max, which is set to 2000, what we find is if you count from zero to 2000 with a prescale factor of one, that gives you a frequency of around 30 kilohertz. Now to actually operate the PWM output, what we actually do is send a value zero to 2000. So 2000 being on all the time, zero being off all the time. So we just need to be mindful of that. 
So we're setting up timer two and timer three and calling commutation off, which just sets all of the outputs to be off, but we'll cover that later. The next method we come to is execute and basically the execute is fairly straightforward it just gets the sensor values which are converted to a commutation position and calculates the motor speed based on that position and then calls whichever mode it needs to call depending on which drive mode it's actually in and in the constructor you'll remember we set it to no drive so it'll start off just executing commutation off every time through this particular loop Okay, let's have a look at adjust speed. We use this method to actually set the speed that we want the motor to run at. So if the speed request is above zero, then we change the operating mode to forward drive. If the speed request is less than zero, then we set it to reverse drive. And if neither of those are true, then we set it to no drive. And the last thing we do is actually calculate the speed reference. So essentially what we're doing is we're constraining the value that we've been sent between minus 2000 and plus 2000, taking the absolute value of it and then casting it to an integer and just saving that in speed reference. So when we want to change it, it'll calculate which mode it needs to be in and also an absolute value for the speed and that we can use for setting the PWM signal. The next method is the e-stop method and that just sets the speed reference to zero and puts the operating mode into e-stop. Okay, the next method here is calculate motor speed and it's past the commutation position. Well, first of all, this if statement is just checking to see whether it's in commutation position one when it wasn't last time it was executed. So just picking up every time it, it enters commutation position one. So we're using that to calculate the difference in time from the last time it was in position one till now. And we're doing that by getting the current time and we're using micros this time, not millis, to get it more accurate. Uh, the revolution duration is the last speed time minus this speed time divided by one million because we're taking micros. Okay, and then we actually do a calculation. The rotation frequency is one over the duration times the number of times that sensor will operate in one revolution of the actual rotor. Now, I haven't set that and that's why I defined it because I'm not too sure what my motor will actually give. I do need to measure that. And the next thing we do is convert that to a speed and then we save the current time as the last speed time. And then of course we also update the last commutation position. Okay, so that's motor speed. Then we start looking at the actual commutation position uh, methods themselves. In commutation off, it's fairly simple. We just set every output to be off. In commutation e stop, essentially what we're doing here is turning off all of the top transistors and turning on all of the bottom transistors. So effectively what we're doing is we're shorting out all of the motor windings. So that provides the most resistance and gives you an emergency stop function. Next, we move into the commutation forward drive. Now, this totally reflects the truth table that we have to the left-hand side. So if we look at commutation position five, which we've got highlighted here on the spreadsheet, we should have B top on and C bottom getting the pulse width modulation signal. And that's what we have here. We've setting A off, B is being set with PWM max, which means it'll be on all the time. C top is off, A bottom is off, B bottom is off, and C bottom has the speed reference signal applied to it, which will be that PWM signal based on the speed that we're being asked to run at. The next case is one, which also reflects the truth table. So we're using the switch statement to apply all the different commutation positions. Now the last thing is we've got a default at the end here. So if we get all zeros from the sensor positions, which is an invalid position, it will just turn off all of the outputs. And then 
we come to the reverse drive and it's just implementing the truth table that we've got here in the reverse mode. This is the method that we'll be using for implementing the regenerative braking as well. There'll just be a different drive mode and a different set of commutation information. The tricky part is going to be determining when it goes into each different drive mode and that needs a little bit more thought. The last method is the get haul sensor. So this is a really simple and straightforward. It's just getting the value for each haul sensor using digital reads and just converting that to the haul value with simple maths. And if the sensor value is greater than six, which we cannot get because you can't have all on at once, then we just set it to zero. So effectively, the only error we should get is when the value is zero. That's it for the class for the moment. As I say, as I implement additional commutation positions, this will change. So I'll upload that to GitHub as I make changes and also make a notification either on Facebook or maybe another YouTube video just to talk about the new bits and pieces but um, anyway that's it for the moment feel free to grab the code if you want to play with it yourself but i guess for the moment until i get the testing finished it's a bit watch this space but at least you've got a good understanding of where i'm up to now with the project okay cheers for now if you like what i'm doing then please do like the video if you'd like to see more then please subscribe and don't forget to hit the chime so you get notified when I post something new. And I'll put a couple of links here to some other videos you can look at.